with Alistair Hunter. Uh, Alistair is the Senior Assessment Manager for Digital at the United Kingdom Accreditation Service. He's a physicist by training and has spent almost 14 years at UCAS leading assessments of multiple digital technology based conformity assessment bodies, including our very own HX certification scheme. So basically, I've got to keep him sweet because he's the boss. Um, uh, and he brings his own extensive knowledge of accreditation standards, procedures, and providing confidence and trust in open uh, marketplaces for age assurance solutions as, as well as here to talk about what UCAS do. Alistair, over to you. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, here and online. Um, so I'm going to talk very generally uh, about UCAS, who we are, and what we do, and then uh, specifically about why my colleague Alan and I are here and what we're hoping to get out of the conference as well, because it's quite useful having such a selection of people present. Uh, UCAS, as it says here, underpins the quality infrastructure in the UK, but it also supports the global quality infrastructure. In the UK, we partner with British Standards and the National Physical Laboratory, um, but globally, we form part of an international framework of accreditation bodies. And whilst this presentation is going to be fairly UCAS centric, in the broadest sense, it will apply in many other countries as well where, ex where accreditation bodies have been established. So UCAS is today the sole national accreditation body for the UK. Uh, it didn't always used to be that way. Testing and inspection and calibration used to be dealt with separately. Um, but they came together in 1995 as a result of a European uh, regulation. Accreditation itself is just independent recognition of the technical competence of organisations to perform specific conformity assessment tasks. And those tasks are quite clearly defined in the standards. They mean calibration, inspection, testing, certification, and we've now got verification and validation has been added to the suite of what we can cover. We look for compliance against these criteria and the criteria are defined in international standards. I've got a slide in a minute that will show you the breadth of those. Um, we have a duty to act in the public interest. So we're commercially aware, but not commercially driven. We are um, not for profit and non-profit distributing. Okay. The UCAS itself's uh, uh, history actually goes back to 1966 with the formation of the British Calibration Service. That was followed in the 70s with the creation of NATLAS, which followed, uh, which um, focused on test laboratory accreditation and competence. And then in, 19, in the early 80s, I can't remember the exact year, I think it was around about 81, the British Calibration Service and NATLAS merged to form NAMAS. And then with the international, with the sort of European regulation coming into force, the UK had to appoint one. So they were amalgamated with the national inspection body accreditation and a similar body for uh, for certification as well so that's who UCAS are we operate under an MOU uh, with the department for business and trade now UCAS itself today has 330 full-time staff about 70 percent of those are technical um, the other 30 percent being the admin um, and support staff that we need to run the UK's national accreditation system. But we also employ a pool of over 700 technical assessors. Uh, these are contracted, uh, contracted in for the provision of their technical knowledge uh, for a variety of activities, because we are active across many sectors. We accredit over 3,000 organisations and deliver 33,000 assessment days per year. So we're quite busy. Um, but our brand is recognised worldwide and we continue to grow. I mentioned there about the 3,000 organisations. The bulk of those uh, remain in testing uh, and calibration, um, closely followed by certification, and certification falls into three different flavours. Um, but in addition to the Assess and Accredit programme, which is the bulk of those accredited organisations, we're also very active um, in the development area, UCAS is particularly, um, I don't think we're unique, but with a more established development capability uh, than some accreditation bodies. We have five full-time development managers who are responsible for taking things from concept and <coughs> developing those uh, with the market 
uh, into some sort of, into a formal accreditation offering that we can operationalize. So with 60 active development projects, we've got another 50 in the pipeline, and those numbers change. Uh, it feels like daily, but they're, it's fairly frequent. Okay. So what is accreditation? Well, ongoing formal recognition of competence, impartiality, and integrity. When one of our conformity assessment bodies delivers their service, you have to be safe. Well, we want to be confident, and you need to be safe in the knowledge that that service has been provided impartially. Um, and that the people doing so are technically competent to consistently deliver the service or the product that you're buying from them. Now, we have many activities here, and there are many standards, as shown on the right-hand side. I'm not going to go through them individually. The bulk of the standards sit within the 17,000 series um, that's been put aside primarily for conformity assessment, but not, not all of them are 17,000. You can see there are some there for... In, uh, validation and verification um, and also laboratory testing has got a different number as well 15189 uh, laboratory testing for uh, medicine I mean okay so we create confidence trust and assurance in the products and services that you buy um, we do that through our conformity assessment bodies by assessing them against agreed international standards which are produced through consensus as Tony mentioned earlier on but we ourselves are also subject to assessment. We have our own standard and we're subject to peer review by our peers. Now, accreditation internationally is sort of arranged into regional hubs. We're part of the European accreditation cooperation, but there are other hubs around the world. And ultimately, coordinating it all is the International Accreditation Forum or Certification and ILAC, which uh, is the Inter International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation, but also co but also includes inspection activities within their remit. With regards to the value of accreditation, it assures efficiency and val valid uh, validity of processes. Sorry, <clears throat> it's lunch for today. Um, also confirms the accuracy of measurements, and but it encourages and creates assurance around innovation. And UCAS is very much um focused on innovation and being agile and responding to the market that's why alan and i are here this week at tony's kind invitation is because i'll talk about it towards the end we have a um a project just starting out at the moment an expression of interest about age assurance um, and that's why we're here we're here to get your input uh, to make sure that what we develop and provide is fit for purpose and meets the needs of the market ultimately it's about delivering confidence in terms of value to business, um, it gives individual companies uh, recognition of the effort they've made, the, the investment they've made in doing things very well into a high technical standard. It breaks down barriers to trade um, and allows, uh, it should allow for re the removal of duplication of effort. Um, <laughs> thanks, Tony Stewart. And ultimately assures the marketplace by providing confidence to customers of the quality, quantity, safety, reliability of the products and services that you get on the market. But it helps governments too. Accreditation builds confidence in standards and quality initiatives. Um, accredited assessment services help promote quality performance requirements and verifies that they are met. It underpins uh, quality and competence in most sectors now, food safety, healthcare, construction, environment, energy and security, to name but a few. And it promotes innovation um, by helping generate public confidence in new markets. Right. Our accreditation process, just as a background, uh, once you, it's not a one step thing, it's not a one trick thing. When you apply for accreditation, uh, we will guide you'll get an assessment manager allocated to you who will guide you through that process. This is if you're a conformity assessment body seeking accreditation. But once you've achieved accreditation, once after you've had your initial assessment and it's been successful, you then go into a continuous quality improvement loop, loop where we conduct surveillance assessments for three years and then we reassess 
in the four. The development process itself, I'm actually going to ask Alan if you wouldn't mind speaking because I'm losing my voice. Um, the development process itself, um, I'm going to get Alan if you could talk yes. to that. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Development process. Um, it's a straightforward, structured process. As, as Alastair said, um, we are a public organisation taking uh, a public interest and delivering in the, uh, the public interest. Our doors are open to any form of conformity assessment that any active organisation may wish to propose. Our role in development is first and foremost to look at any application and to determine is that application sensible, is it delivering a purposeful product and will it meet the public interest. It's not our role to go out and then evaluate and find out that information, it's the role of the applicant to demonstrate to UCAS so we ask the applicant, how did you determine the public interest? What is the market sector? What assurance is this providing? And why is it providing? And why is it needed? So that's the first fundamental. And we, we take that through. Um, we start by going through a documentary review of what does the conformity assessment look like? How is it structured? What are the requirements, the specified requirements? So the first question we ask is, what is the object of conformity? What is going to be measured? How is it going to be measured, the specified requirements? And then what are the methods of evaluating that object of conformity and confirming that something is correct? So an attestation can be made. And that's normally a documentary process. That takes three to six months to go through and argue. And then after that, once we're satisfied that the framework is in place, then we go through the, the format that Alistair has just spoken about, whereby we have a CAB or a certification body or an inspection body. They apply to UCAS and say, can we actually deliver this conformity assessment? Uh, and we would then take them through the, the initial um, processes. Come on, Francis. <laughs> I'm learning how the technology works. The development pipeline. We maintain a pipeline of interests. So because we are an open public body and anybody can come to us, as Alastair said, we've got about 60 projects in the pipeline at the moment and many, many more. Every week we get many people knocking on our door saying we want to develop an accreditation process for this particular conformity assessment. We, we operate uh, an inquiries process that anybody can come to, they can make an inquiry. There's a whole list of application forms and data on the UCAS website that tells you how to go through this, how to make an application, and interested parties can submit an inquiry to us. So that we, we initially review that inquiry, a very quick two hour um, free of cost review to say, what is the objective? Do we think it's accredi accreditable? Where are the gaps? What does the inquirer have to do to demonstrate to us that this is a, a logical and a credible conformity assessment? So we ask a few basic questions. If it's good, we accept it as an inquiry and we put it into the pipeline. Obviously, um, we accept inquiries that need work to be done we would point out where we perceive gaps or further information. As I said, it's not for us to go out and search for the information. It is down to the individual applicant to actually bring that information to us. So we put it into the, uh, the, the pipeline and as it progresses and we work through, we will take that through the development process, building our knowledge, building the knowledge of the client until we have a satisfactory arrangement whereby we think this is an accreditable product that we can then accredit. Um, you can see here we have many schemes. We have food and farming. We have building and construction. We have engineering. We have t laboratory testing. 
anything that you can think of as a national accreditation body, we have to consider an application. And as Alastair said, we're looking at age verification at the moment and helping Tony. Um, this is a new area of accreditation. And so in our pipeline, it's marked up. Uh, and one of the purposes of today for Alastair and me being here is to listen and get some feedback from yourselves. What do you think you need in terms of accreditation? Or what, what assurances do you think the marketplace needs? And what can we, as a national accreditation body, factor in and also as a national accreditation body share our experiences and our knowledge with other accreditation bodies around the world so that we can replicate and consistently deliver the same message we have a number of UCAS training courses um, they're referred to as awareness courses and they go through the native criteria for accreditation Accreditation is delivered against international standards. They are ISO IEC 1700 series. And there's ISO IEC 1720 for inspection, 1725 for testing, 1724 for personnel certification, and I've got 1721 for management systems, and 1765 for product, and then 1729 for verification and valid validation. These are very generic framework standards. They say there will be uh, an application process. You will go out and review that application. You'll collect the data, and then you'll make an attestation of good and bad against that data. You'll be independent. You will have a competence process so that the people that you're using are actually competent in the field to go out and do those assessments and that there'll be a decision or, or maybe not a decision, depending on the 1700 series that you use. We run awareness courses on those 1700 series standards to go through the framework and what the expectations of those frameworks are and how they should be applied. We don't provide consultancy. We just merely quote the clauses of the standard and then encourage conversation amongst a group to say what is your view and and then everybody having that view we then channel the view to where we think it should be so that everybody gets a consistent understanding of the underpinning requirement of the 1700 series they last two days they're available online they're available in the office at stains and all are welcome you don't need to be working for a conformity assessment body um, any interested party may register and come along and join in. Right, what's the last? Oh. The best bit, contact details. We're based in Staines, which is uh, just uh, southwest of London by Heathrow Airport. So we are uh, imminently placed for international travellers to come and visit us. We're we're imminently placed one hour from London uh, for anybody to come and visit us. So, all, as I say, all and sundry are welcome to contact UCAS. And we are here to help and support and underpin any form of uh, assurance that the public interest requires. Thank you. And that takes us to any questions. Are you all right, Alistair? Yeah, yeah. I shall yeah, yeah, yeah. shout if, if needed. <clears throat> any questions? Any questions online? Can we see? <laughs> no, it looks like you've uh, stunned everybody into silence, Alistair. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you, Alan, as well. Um, <coughs> very welcome.